So I'm going to start in a minute. I'd like to first of all welcome you all. Thank you very much for coming. I'll mention one interesting and useful fact, uh, which is if you find yourself studying here and you find yourself sitting in these theatres, should there be a fire alarm, rather than going out into the lobby and, gra and joining a large crowd of people trying to get out the doors, up behind you there is an exit which leads to the open air. I hope that this information will not be useful to you, but <laughs> all the same, I thought I'd mention it. So thanks for coming in to, to take a look around Trinity. Um, I'm sure that many of you have already got information off the, off the web, uh, and you, you're supplementing that with impressions here. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of information, some of it wrong, uh, and uh, you know, you, you just got to sort of navigate around and see what you think is, is possibly true. Because our web pages go out of date as well, and we don't have the, the manpower always to keep them as fresh as they ought to be. However, we've been here a long time, and we'll probably be here for the next few years as well. In fact, Italian here, and the three other languages, have got the oldest tradition in the world of university-level language study, since the chairs were set up in 1776, long before Italian, or before, far, long before contemporary languages were respectable and certainly long before English was respectable. The idea you could take a degree in English in a university was considered scandalous up to about 1900. There you go. Anyway, I'm here to tell you about, to sell you Italian, but I'd like to do something a little broader. I'd like to tell you about languages in general and why it's useful to have them. Uh, and not, you know, even if you don't decide to come and do Italian here, uh, if you've already got some or if you want to keep up your languages, uh, there are very good reasons for doing so. We are the most international uh, school in the, in the university, and we have the broadest coverage of different languages uh, in, in the Irish university system. By definition, we're looking at languages other than our own, and um, we have recently acquired uh, Near and Middle in Eastern studies, which brings us Hebrew and Arabic as on top of our many other languages. So if you're interested in languages, uh, Trinity is a really good place to come. Uh, why bother with languages when we all know English and everyone knows English and the whole world runs on English? Well, it might stop you from invading Iraq uh, because you can't understand what's going on. But, you know, apart from that, what else is useful about it? Well, English is indeed a tremendous and wonderful resource. Uh, thousand, a thousand million speakers uh, almost as many as Mandarin Chinese, and spoken in many languages where people have got other languages as well, like Indian English is different from Irish English, is different from English English, is different from American English, and so forth. It's a marvelous legacy to have in this country, to be English and to be part of, uh, of Europe and even inside the Euro is one of, our, one of the main reasons for, to be English speakers is one of the main reasons for Ireland's relative success, which is still a relative success, in recent decades. But it's only one of a very large number of languages, several thousand languages still spoken in the world today. Um, I haven't come to Italian yet, but even if you put all of these uh, together, they don't make up very much of the entire population of the seven billion. The European Union uh, has, I think, 26 languages or something in uh, in official use now, including Irish as well. Um, so it is an extremely multilingual space. And although English and French uh, are used uh, very broadly in certain areas of it, there's still a great deal of activity that takes place across languages at official language, at official level. And of course, the population don't all, by just joining the European Union, speak something called European. It is an extremely culturally diverse and interesting uh, and uh, varied place from a linguistic point of view, as everything else. I was wrong about the number of languages. This is why you shouldn't rely on people telling you facts off the podium. 23 official languages, uh, including, of course, uh, Italian. The big languages, you would think again of English as being possibly the dominant language in Europe, but by, by, uh, in terms of sheer numbers of speakers, uh, German uh, is bigger, French is bigger, uh, Italian is slightly smaller than, than uh, English, and then you have sort of minor languages such as Spanish, which has only got 40 million speakers or so in the EU, but has another 
360 million worldwide. So there is a world language other than English that you could study here. Um, the recent arrival of Polish uh, has brought a huge number of people with a, with a, a new language uh, and a certain, uh, I mean, Polish is apparently the second, in, fe in effect, the second language of Ireland uh, at, at the present time. Um, not many people know, there are more people who live in Holland than in the whole of Scandinavia. But the thing about the Dutch is they embarrassingly all speak perfect English. It's, you really do feel terribly ignorant when you, when you go there. Um, there is this neighbor to the east, which has been at different times of great interest, and Trinity has the only Russian and Slavonic uh, department in the whole country. Um, in Queens, Belfast, they've been abolishing languages as fast as they can because what Northern Ireland doesn't need is contact with the outside world. Russian was the first to go, Italian has gone, who knows what else will go eventually. They used to have Russian, we've still got it. It is of, of, of interest and use, people go and work there and we may need them again, who knows. Now English, as I was saying, is a marvelous language to have and about 50% of the EU's 500 million people speak some English, either as a native, uh, either they're native speakers or they speak some English as a foreign language, and some of them extremely well. However, if you want to, if you want to sell things to people, if you want to react, int interact with them on a, de a level of detail, then having their language or being able to move between your language and theirs is obviously of extreme interest. And as half of the population of Europe don't have English either as a first or as a, a reasonably good foreign language. There's still a very, um, a very large amount of business to be done and contacts to be made uh, and cultural life to be lived. As I was saying, yeah, the Dutch really, really do speak English. Uh, the Italians mostly don't. Um, you, they might have some, uh, some English. The older generation in Italy uh, did French and although the younger generation does English now as a foreign language, it isn't always, uh, it isn't always taught in a very communicative uh, way. Um, but interestingly, Italian scientists write their papers in English before they, they don't make an Italian version very often. Uh, some Italian rock stars write directly in English. Um, so the, it is spreading, but it's spreading in particular areas for particular purposes. There's still an awful lot of people who would like to know you uh, and uh, don't have your language. But rather than the utilitarian reason for doing language, the, uh, the, main, the main gain, and if you're going to spend you know, three or four years of your life doing it, you have to have something in mind in college other than the job you're going to get at the end. Um, flexibility, breadth of mind, understanding other cultures, which curiously enough has the, I mean, the biggest actual effect of doing foreign languages in university, the biggest obvious benefit is you get to know your own language because you no longer see it as the way things are. You see it as a mode of expression. You understand its limitations and its potentials. English is a wonderful language uh, and you'll understand it better if you've, if you've gone into depth in other languages and cultures as well. And being able to move around the EU of peculiar interest at the present time, but always of interest being able to live and work in different places. Like you could live in, you could work in uh, Grand Canal Dock for Google if you had foreign languages. They need people. They have entire floors of their building with different national flags and uh, groups of people trying to sell their product into different markets. They're very interested, and as are all the multinationals, most of the translation of software from Microsoft is done from Dublin. It's been very important having uh, at least a cohort of people so that not everybody who comes, uh, who, who comes uh, to work in those places has to be uh, foreign. But again, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of halfway between the cultural now and the utilitarian. If you do languages, well, first of all, you'll be used to a lot of hard work because languages are hard. And they're not just hard in year three, four. In fact, they're easier in year th three, four. They're hard from the start. If you were looking for a really relaxing subject to sleep your way through, junior and senior fresh, um, well, I won't mention any, any particular subjects you could do this in, but I, I, they are there. Um, you, can take a light, you can take a subject with a very gentle slope to start you off, or you can try rock climbing from the start, which is what you do with languages. 
the same as you would if you were going to be a ballet dancer or, or well, a rock climber, I suppose. So you do learn hard work, application, uh, expression, being able to present yourself in different contexts, but also being able to think, being able to look thing up, uh, things up, uh, being able to manage your time. This is, for those of you who are school leavers, the most difficult thing in university. Uh, there is not somebody with a bell uh, pushing you from here to there. And those of you who have done very well so far by, by being awfully good at things you've just been told to do, you're going to have to learn the second skill, which is telling yourself the things you're going to be awfully good at, and then doing them. Surprisingly hard. It takes some of us 30, 40 years to get a handle on that. So there are many skills, and lang language graduates are among the most employable uh, and useful members of society because they've had to adapt. They have, they're very good at shifting their focus and getting a handle on new things. Um, just my, uh, a very quick uh, biography of one of our uh, graduates who did Italian and French, uh, got a job working for a, an airline called Ryanair uh, in Italy, where he was uh, getting the Italian airports uh, to get the Ryanair planes in and out on time. Uh, he got this job because he had some Italian. He rose to be country manager of Ryanair for Italy. Doesn't bear thinking of. Then to be the public relations spokesman for, for uh, Ryanair, which again doesn't bear thinking of. Uh, and then he migrated finally to well, what used to be the relative calm of the Football Association, uh, where indeed his, his skills may be put to good use with the uh, import of a wonderful Italian football manager. But I'm going to, what I'm saying is doing languages, it's not just for having a job. It's not just for doing well yourself. It's for being part of the real world, the wider world, not being trapped in a single culture. Because although the world is now, the, the news you hear comes drip, drip out of news services, largely English-based, uh, and you will hear a lot of stuff that you've heard before. If you hear a news item, you'll hear it seven times uh, that day. It will always have much the same slant. It is just so interesting to hear that there's other ways of looking at things. So despite Mr. Murdoch's very good personal qualities, which I can't recall at the present time, and he does have some good pub pub publications other than uh, the Sun and the News of the World and so on. Um, you wouldn't want to live your entire life inside his head. You would want to know that there's other things out there and other languages, other cultures, other perspectives on the world. English is the greatest language in the world because it has the greatest writer in the world, Mr. William Shakespeare, who wouldn't, however, have been quite the writer that he was had he never heard of Italy, had he never taken stories from Italian sources. Now, one of the nice things about literature is, although you study it, you know, French literature, English literature, and so on, actually writers pick up this stuff from everywhere. And there's great European traditions of distortion and uh, development of existing, of existing stories. The uh, Italians call Romeo and Juliet, Giulietta e Romeo, back to front, but they're entitled to it because it's their story. And this is supposed to be the actual balcony in Verona, again, uh, where, well, he's supposed to have climbed up it. Um, yeah, I mean, many Shakespeare plays come from the great Italian writers, and a lot of European fiction has been shaped by the great Italian writers. One of the people you would study is Dante Alighieri, whom we start on in the second year, or his uh, younger compatriot, another Florentine, uh, Francesco Petrarca, who tells you how you, ought to, how you ought to fall in love and how it ought to affect you. And people have been following his instructions now for 600 and something years. The Italians have been reasonably inventive, reasonably good at things. It hasn't always worked as well as it should. Um, some of the, what you will hear about modern, Italian, about modern Italy is not entirely complimentary. Here, for example, is a, what Mr. Berlusconi t t uh, terms a communist publication that is out to uh, blacken his name. And if you think The Economist is a communist publication, well, you shouldn't be doing economics anyway. Um, so yeah, some, sorry, this man, yes. He is thinking, he has a great plan. He hasn't told it to us, yet, uh, told it to us yet. There are many links between Ireland and Italy for a variety of reasons and always have been, historical and religious and cultural and so forth. So from an Irish point of view, there's also reasons for doing Italian.
Okay, briefly, as time is moving on, what's it like? You come into the first year, uh, most of our students are complete beginners. We're one of the departments that takes complete beginners. Uh, and um, we work them hard because we want them to catch up on those who have already done it. And even those who have already done it, we work them hard just out of sheer habit. And by the end of the first year, you will know an awful lot of language. So whether you do TSM Italian or European Studies Italian, you'll do an awful lot of language. If you do the European Studies, the content areas of your course, which you will do through Italian, are obviously of European social and political uh, interest, whereas on the TSM side, it is culture and history and literature, which is partly, one of the, one of the nice things about literature is it makes the most of language. As you know, if you've got a favorite poem or even a, a, a favorite song, whatever, uh, you will know that that embodies your, whatever language it's in better than most other things. And so studying literature is a means of recycling your knowledge of the language to a much higher level. The content areas of TSM in the first year, history from the Risorgimento on, literature, including a novel, or a memoir in this case, in the present time, uh, examples of Italian theater and poetry. And then uh, you, you, you progress to higher levels of these same areas in the second and subsequent years. Just to mention the history of Italy, it was united through having been a number of disparate little states, the biggest of them being the papal states, um, in, well, no, actually even bigger was the Kingdom of Naples, in uh, 1861. And last year, the Italians celebrated 150 years of unity, but when I say celebrated, they're still fighting about it and arguing. Was it a good idea? Was it, you know, did it all work out terribly badly? Uh, should we have bothered? So the great heroes of the, the, uh, the uh, Risorgimento, if you regard them as heroes, the military adventurer Garibaldi, the statesman and diplomat Cavour, were then succeeded by uh, other leaders some of them very long-lived indeed, um, who led Italy through a, a phase of parliamentary government and various compromises and involvement in the First World War, and then managed to uh, introduce after the First World War the, the first version of European fascism. Uh, I mean, 70 years ago, most of Europe, if you got out a map, was under the control of fascist regimes of one sort or another, the Italians sort of invented it and gave us the name and so on, and certainly lovely uniforms. And uh, they weren't actually the worst of the fascists. But the last European fascist government changed in the 1970s, really quite recently. So that particular sad bit of European history it would very much come into your Italian, your Italian uh, course. Um, Nazism is now most famous in Europe for the massacre of the Jews. Uh, and Italy is slightly involved in that. Some countries, even ones that were fascist or were dominated by, fasci by fascism, weren't so bad. Uh, Italy would be on the not so bad, but you don't want to be any part of this. Uh, and in fact, the, the novel we're doing is a memoir by Rosetta Loi, a, an Italian uh, novelist, who remembers her youth growing up in Rome and how, as a child, she didn't understand how the, the Jews in her area were gradually being uh, rounded up or disappearing or moving away. Um, so that tragic story, she puts a great deal of the blame for it on the Catholic Church, notably Pope Pius XII. It's a controversial view, but uh, one which is widely held. And so even when we're doing, say, a work of literature, a work of, of prose, we're also looking at important uh, historical um, issues, some of which r remain alive today. Theatre, Dario Fo, uh, one of several Italian Nobel Prize winners. Uh, he's perhaps the most surprising one, and he was quite surprised himself when he was told he'd got it. A, a wonderful man of the theatre and also a political agitator of the extreme left. Uh, in his youth, he was a member of a fascist militia, but he's thought better of it since. And now he's a, a, a very uh, vociferous and entertaining sort of communist. Um, and he's written some of, some of the greatest uh, shows of of Italian, modern Italian theater. So you would study uh, some works of his which have got, again, political re relevance of the, of the present time, or indeed 
which question religious traditions dating back a thousand years. Uh, poetry, yeah, you also do poetry. I'm, I, I don't have time to, uh, to, to go through everything. In uh, the second year, you continue with the language, the literature, the culture, and you get into Dante, starting with his Inferno. That's Dante in the middle in the red dress, and he's showing the people of Florence on his left, on our right, what's going to happen to them when they die if they don't behave themselves, they will go down through the gates of hell, or if they behave a little better, they'll go up the mountain of purgatory, and eventually, those of us who are saved, which includes perhaps a few people in the room, will join the spheres of heaven and uh, be happy, blissfully happy ever after. So that's a great story dating from about, about 1300 and still written in Italian that can be understood today. A great story of what all human life is about, what creation and the universe are about and how you can hope to save your soul, if you have one, uh, and uh, told in, in terms of a, 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 a travel a, a, a journey, uh, a visit by a living man to the, un the other world. So it's a pretty, a pretty gripping story in its own way. It's one of the most remote pieces of literature in time that you can study in a modern language because uh, Italian has changed formally less than almost any other European language. Um, but it's also one that we can relate to, the seven deadly sins, which you meet, you meet them going down, you meet them coming up, uh, you have visions, you meet the world's most beautiful and perfect woman, she drags you up to heaven, uh, you see God. How many, how many degree courses could offer you that? Unfortunately, seeing God proves to be too much for Dante and he sort of explodes at the end of the poem, but there you are. Uh, Petrarch, I've already mentioned, one of the founders of European love poetry, his love for Laura, uh, the, the perfect and unattainable woman. Uh, unattainable for a few, women, a few reasons. Number one, she may not have liked him. Number two, she was a married woman. Number three, she, he was a priest. Nothing is perfect in this life. and you, you, this, these, Our course will give you a chance to start getting used to that. You'll study a bit of Lorenzo dei Medici, who was not just a, a highly successful ruler of Florence in the Renaissance, but also uh, a, a, a poet and writer. To study Italian cinema, which is one of the leading world cinemas, and one which is very accessible, I think, to, to uh, people, any, anybody from a European background. Italian cinema has brought us some of the some of the masterworks of the 20th century, and some of these will be covered in the in the second year course. And you have an option of continuing further with the third year course. Uh, Naples is uh, sorry, Italy is famous for organized crime. In fact, there's a public lecture on the subject next Monday at 7.15. An international expert on organized crime is going to come and speak in this building next Monday evening. But he's going to make the point that, uh, that organized crime is a transnational thing and not just Italian. This film is about the Neapolitan version of it, the, the uh, Camorra, not just the Sicilian Mafia. These will be some of the topics that you could study in the cinema. We also study Italian culture from an anthropological point of view, how the society works, how it feels about itself, how it deals with different, uh, different issues such as uh, relations between men and women. Um, as part of your course, if you do a degree course in, in, uh, in any of our foreign languages, you've got to visit the country. And uh, it's not such a bad thing to have to do. You can even take a, a year or part of a year as a Socrates student in an Italian university. We have our own links with certain, certain uh, universities and other departments in which you may also be studying have got a few links of their own. So there are quite a few possibilities of getting through your two months in Italy while also studying. If you're doing two languages, you've got to spend four months abroad. Uh, I've been, as, as I've been suggesting, this is not exactly a penance. Italy is full of very beautiful historic places, which can also be quite a lot of fun. More literature, more culture in the third year. In, but we also bring your language skills to a higher pitch. We teach you not just how to know the language, but how to use it in different contexts, including translation and research. Um, the whole, since the advent of the, of the web, translation and the editing of translations have been totally transformed. And you will learn some of the skills that you need now to stay afloat in a world that's full of texts, most of them wrong. 
At the end of your third year in our system, the TSM, you uh, choose which of your two subjects to carry on into the fourth year. Uh, and then you go on with, uh, with, with further aspects of what you've already done, if you go on with Italian, but also your other subjects, uh, and you pursue some of your personal interests, uh, particularly in your dissertation topic. So people have managed to smuggle back into their Italian their other subject, or entirely different interests that they've always had. Recently we had uh, a student who had enjoyed art history, hadn't done art history in college, but just wanted to give it a crack in her final year, and so she had to go at William Turner's Venice, and wrote a very nice and interesting dissertation on that. Somebody who had done film studies, but had opted for Italian in her fourth year, still managed to work uh, Italia, uh, to, uh, Italian cinema back into her dissertation. Uh, uh, a gifted translator has worked on problems of translating a modern Italian poet. Somebody interested in, uh, in po political life did Mazzini and the Risorgi Main film. Uh, another art history, but related to, to literature. Uh, this is a, a picture from the Prado of one of the famous stories from Boccaccio's Decameron. Uh, a boy who subsequently went on to become a diplomat decided to do Napoleon. This could be a form of you know, self-selection of your future career, but we hope he does less damage. Masculinities in Italian cinema. The Italian man turns out to be a very fragile fellow who needs a lot of looking after and is never sure where he's going. The films of Federico Fellini, one of the great geniuses of uh, the 20th century. This was another topic uh, that yielded an extremely uh, nice and interesting dissertation. So there comes a point in your course where you've learned what we told you, and then you get to combine that with stuff you already know or would like to find out. Follow your own interests. Join societies when you're a student here. There's a lot to be learned, not just from us, but from each other. We also have a particular scholarship in Pavia that we, we, we make available to students who are carrying on into the fourth year. Now, what sort of careers? Well, there are many, many careers. Uh, I've mentioned some of them already, um, many of them having to do with communication of one sort or another, which, are, uh, con uh, which our graduates have pursued. Uh, talking jobs, such as management consulting, recruitment, theater, lecturing if you're really stuck, modeling, although I cannot say that everything that, uh, that she was able to do came from what we told her, some, some of it she brought with her. Uh, writing plays one of our better known graduates. More university research, radio producing for the BBC. I mean, who would have guessed? But this, this student already knew an awful lot about football before he ever came near us. So essentially, when, you're, when you finish your degree, you will feel more or less as you do today, starting on something new. You've got to go out and orientate yourself in the world with language training, you can do that, and uh, you can then make, make what you want, make what you can out of it. Information on our minimum points uh, is already on the yellow sheets beside you. And uh, I, my last point would be, even if you're not going to do Italian, even if you're not going to do languages, keep up languages in general. You will be very surprised, uh, I have very close personal experience of this, uh, of what knowing a language, what doors knowing a language can open up for you in totally different and unrelated spheres. So keep up your languages. They will bring you further than you might have thought. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you, some of you do decide to come to Trinity, maybe even study Italian, and I hope you enjoy the next few years. I can take questions, well, just for a minute now, uh, but also if, you, if people want to talk to me afterwards, that's fine. Thank you very much.